Welcome to the Grattle Team Workshop Series. My name is Debbie McCutsky, and I'm the coordinator of services and programs for graduate student legal aid, and I use she, her pronouns. On behalf of the Grad Legal Aid team, uh, we are happy to see you on Zoom, as well as those who will be watching this on YouTube. Um, today's workshop is car buying and car care. But before we dive into that, I just want to remind you or let you know that Legal Aid is here to help. We have a variety of services and you have already paid for them because you paid your graduate student fee and a portion of that fee supports our office. So quickly, I will just tell you what we do. Um, we provide legal consultations on general legal matters, like if you're having a problem with your landlord. Um, we provide legal consultations um, on immigration matters. Uh, we provide advocacy for students who get charged by the university. Uh, I am a notary, so I can help you with that. Um, right now, that is our only in-person service. And then finally, we have this workshop series. So if you want more information, we have a terrific website. Um, you'll see on that more details about our services and it and that includes how to request an appointment so let's see what's next um so just a bit of housekeeping i want to let you know that automatic closed captioning has been enabled and uh, near the end of the workshop we'll post a survey because we want to know how we're doing was this workshop helpful to you uh, we will email links to the survey, the slides, and the recording to everyone who registered for the workshop. That'll happen either this afternoon or first thing tomorrow morning. Um, and we always post all of those links on our website on the workshop page. So um, in terms of questions during the presentation, keep them coming. Um, you can post them in the chat for everyone to see. And if you want to speak with us, um, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you. So let's move on to the workshop. I am so pleased to introduce our speakers. Um, they are highly experienced investigators from the Montgomery County Office of Consumer Protection. Um, first of all, I'll start with Sharon Margolis. Um, she has been with that office for the past 27 years. Woohoo! Um, she has a law degree from GW University, and she is a member of the Maryland Bar. Um, and I will thank her once again for coming back and be doing this workshop with us. This is her fifth year. Thank you, Sharon. No problem. Um, I also want to introduce um, Bernie Vega. Um, he also is an investigator, and he has been with that office for 15 years. Um, this is his second year joining us for this workshop. So as investigators, um, their duties include handling consumer complaints, um, as well as participating in consumer education and out outreach activities. And we are just, again, so lucky to have them here with us today. So Sharon and Bernie, take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm Sharon Margolis. Um, I'm going to start off, um, do the car buying part of this um, presentation. So um, as uh, Debbie said, we work for the Office of Consumer Protection and just um, a little bit of information about our office. We do handle disputes between merchants and consumers, uh, usually over transactions that occur in Montgomery County. Um, we do have investigators that are available by phone, email, or in person with questions you may have. Um, we enforce the county's consumer protection laws. Uh, we do things like this, educate and reach out to the community, and we do license and regulate certain businesses. Uh, that includes new home builders, motor vehicle repair shops, towers, secondhand personal property vendors, and appliance repair. So when you are 
looking to purchase a car, research is always going to be very important. Um, of course, the first thing you're going to want to do is decide what size and type of car you even need or want. Um, you shouldn't just be considering price. You also, also want to consider the cost to maintain the vehicle, its reliability, uh, its resale value. Um, Consumer Reports has a lot of information about all of these things. Um, they do do some articles on the cost of car ownership over time. Uh, Kelly Blue Book also does. They have um, they'll have a, a information on five year cost to own. Some of the other websites are um, Edmonds and um, NADA, which is the National Automobile Dealers Association. Um, and, you know, another major decision is going to be a new whether you're going to get a new car or a used car. There are advantages of, of new cars. Of course, you're going to usually end up with more advanced technology, better safety, connectivity, fuel efficiency. Um, it's generally a little easier to shop for a new car. You're not having to do quite as much inspection of the vehicle. You're not having to worry as much about history. Um, there are more and cheaper financing options for new cars. Um, Manufacturers may have incentives to, um, uh, you know, make the, the pricing more um, interesting to you. Uh, and, uh, of course, you there will generally be a factory warranty that comes with the vehicle as well. There are, of course, advantages of used cars. You're going to get a lower price. There, you'll get more car for the money. Um, less depreciation because you've already uh, gone past a lot of that major depreciation. Um, and you will generally have lower car insurance rates as well. And, you know, there is that subset of used cars, the certified used car, which is su supposed to be a better car to start with. They generally have a limit on the age and mileage of the car that will be able to be considered as a certified car. Um, there will be a, an extended warranty that, that will be offered through the manufacturer, and there may be some special financing that would um, bring it a little bit closer to the financing that would be available for a new car. But you still can't always trust the selection process that the dealer goes through. There is still going to be a history involved. Um, the warranties that they offer may or may not be worth it. Um, you have to, and you're just going to need to compare what warranties and financing you can get elsewhere for a non-certified car. You know, there are websites such as Autotrader, Cars.com, CarGurus. Those, those are websites that will offer both research and shopping. So places for you to look. You should never leave it up to the seller to tell you what you need to know. You, you don't just go into a car dealership and, and ask for the salesperson's recommendation. You're always going to want to go in with your own information. Um, you're always going to want to ask them questions, of course, but you're going to want to have your information on hand and not rely on them. So there are obviously different places you can go to look for your vehicle or who you're going to buy the vehicle from. You're going to buy it from a dealer, from a private individual. And um, there are advantages and disadvantages with each of those. You know, dealers are required to be licensed with the Motor Vehicle Administration in the state of Maryland. So it is providing you with some level of regulatory oversight, um, laws that they need to comply with, and uh, the ability um, to check with either a Consumer Protection Office or a Motor Vehicle Administration to see if there have been complaints. You know, these are businesses operating in the marketplace. Um, the um, Deal, uh, manufacturer warranties or dealer warranties uh, are, are something that, that you can get with, with a dealer that you may not be able to get through a private individual. Um, cars do have to be put through safety inspection. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, private individual, if you're buying from a private individual, I'm oh, sorry. Um, of course, the car may cost less, but as we said, they will have less regulatory oversight. Now, there is also issues um, that there are individuals out there who will pretend that they were the private owner of a vehicle, but are actually an unlicensed dealer. We call them curb stoners, and they um, you really should not try not to be doing business with somebody who is a curb stoner masquerading as a private owner of a vehicle. You know, when you're shopping online, uh, dealers will have their own websites, but their inventory can also appear on third-party websites. 
you should be really wary when you're shopping on sites such as Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. Um, that's where um, a lot of these curb stoners, um, these unlicensed dealers, um, post a lot of their ads for vehicles. And now, of course, we've also got companies that offer that 100% online buying experience like Carvana or Vroom. You've probably heard of them. Um, but both of those uh, companies have been having issues um, experiencing titling and registration problems. You may have heard of uh, the lawsuit against Carvana um, on, the, on that issue. Um, people that get the cars and they're not able to provide the title, so consumers aren't able to drive the vehicles because they can't get them registered. Sharon, I have a question about the curb stoners. Sure. And does, and does anyone um, like maintain a list of folks who've been identified as that? Or like how, how would you even begin to get your radar up about you know, well, that's yeah, a good question. If if someone has filed a complaint against a particular person with our office, there are times that we would have um, a record of a complaint being filed with us. Um, a good a, a good thing to do when you're um, start doing business with someone, if you think that might be a possibility, um, you can do a um, a case search in the Maryland judiciary and see if there have been any lawsuits filed against them. The public can do that right on the uh, right right on the uh, on the court's website. So that's another place you might be able to look to see if some red red flags may pop up about a, someone if you you're a little concerned. You know, the key is whose name is the title in. You know, if if you you know the name of the person you're doing business with and you verify that with their by looking at at their um, you know. Uh, driver's license, and then you ask to see a copy of the title. See if the copy of the title is in the same name as the person whose driver's license you're looking at. If not, that's a possibility that this person may not actually be the private owner of the vehicle and may actually be an unlicensed dealer who you shouldn't be doing business with. Hey, thank you. Um, another thing too is be careful about using payment apps. You really shouldn't pay for something as uh, significant as a vehicle with a payment app because it's difficult to trace if there's a problem with the car later. So once you identified a vehicle, you need to make sure that you inspect it very carefully. And this even applies with new cars. It's not the same kind of inspection with a new car as with a used car, but even with a new car, you should always check for damage before you sign any paperwork. I've had many situations where people don't look at the car before they take it home. They get home and they find a, you know, dents and dings that they're not happy with. Um, you want to make sure that the vehicle is in the condition that you want it to be before you leave the before you even sign the paperwork because it's really hard to undo it once you've taken it once you've signed the paperwork and taken the car home. Used cars should be inspected by a mechanic and a body shop. And we talked a little bit before about um, the safety inspection that used vehicles are required by law to undergo prior to sale or transfer. Um, but you know, a safety inspection is not the same thing as a as a comprehensive mechanical inspection. A safety inspection is only going to focus on things that make a car unsafe to drive. It's not going to look at any mechanical problem, any particular mechanical problems that may affect it, that, you know, you may consider it unsafe, but that's not something that um, the police are going to consider unsafe. So again, don't just rely on the safety inspection. That is a very low bar. You want to make sure that you take it to a mechanic and a body shop. And if the person or dealership that you're working with won't let you do that, then that's a red flag and may not be someone you won't, should be doing business with. So with the um, safety inspections, it's generally the seller or the transferor of the vehicle who's required to obtain the inspection certificate. Although in a private party transaction, the seller or the buyer may obtain the inspection certificate. And the buyer and or, trans, and or transferee then submits the inspection certificate to the MVA in order to register the vehicle.
So you want to find out as much as you can about a vehicle's history. Now, there are ways to do that. I don't know if, if, if you've heard of these websites like Carfax or AutoCheck. Uh, they are good resources, but you have to be aware that it's not going to catch everything and it may not always be accurate. Um, you know, if the owner paid cash for an accident repair and didn't file an insurance claim, it may not show up on a report. Um, there is also the National Insurance Crime Bureau uh, that is a free source of information, although that's limited uh, mainly to whether a vehicle has been salvaged or stolen. But you should always ask the seller questions, whether it's the dealer or the private or a private individual. Has the car been in an accident? Where did the car come from? Ask for repair and maintenance records. And any answers that they give you, get the representations in writing. It's very hard to prove anything oral after the fact. So if they have represented to you that the car has never been in an accident, get them to sign an agreement to that effect. You should always negotiate a selling price before discussing financing. We've talked some about the um, websites where you can research prices online, cars.com, nada.com, kbb.com. You should never negotiate based on a monthly payment. It's inevitable if you tell a dealer how much you can afford per month. Amazingly, every car that comes up is going to have that monthly payment. Don't do it. Negotiate on the price, the financing you can deal with later. Um, there are, if you're not comfortable with the negotiating process, there are buying services such as Car Bargains, which is through Checkbook Magazine and Authority Auto, who will negotiate for you um, for a fee, small one. Uh, but it may be worth the price if you're not comfortable with the process. And, and they do guarantee that if they provide you with um, with uh, if they do the negotiating for you and provide you with some numbers and then you find you're able to get a, a better deal yourself, they will refund you the fee. Um, just anecdotally, I did have a relative that did use car bargains and then tried to do it themselves and they were not able to get a better deal. So doesn't mean it's always going to work, but it's just depends on how comfortable you are with the process. And I'm also, I'm not sure how how it's working during this this market um you know where there's not as much negotiating going on um i i think the services are still there but um you I, you know how much more you're going to get out of it at this point um it, it is a little different market now um but uh it still removes you from that negotiating process if it's not something you're comfortable with doing and some companies, Costco, AAA, American Express, um, and some credit unions actually even offer their own car buying programs where they've negotiated with dealers on pricing and things like that. But the most important thing is just don't be afraid to walk away. Don't let them bully you into anything. You've got your feet, you use them. So once you do have the price, you know that you've got to know that you have many options when it comes to financing. You aren't limited to what the dealer offers. Um, banks and credit unions can finance vehicles as well. And you can do your research on that before you go shopping as well. Um, banks and credit, some of them will even pre-approve you. You can come in with a pre-approval. So uh, you should also be aware that any dealer financing may not actually be final when you take delivery of the vehicle. Uh, this is called spot delivery or yo-yo sales. So what will happen is, you know, maybe the bank's not open. You're, it's a Sunday night and you're signing all the paperwork and, you know, it probably, yes, it probably will get financed, but there's no transferring of, you know, no, nobody at the bank making a decision at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night. Um, so maybe the next day when the bank sees, reviews all the numbers, they may decide they need some additional information or it's not what they thought. And um, it may, um, they may, they may actually reject the deal. There are certain di disclosures that in Maryland that, that dealers are required to make regarding this practice. There, there are forms that they have to provide to you. If the financing is not final, when you take delivery of the vehicle, then, um, they, you have to sign this particular form that acknowledges that, and they have to inform you within four days um, 
if if the financing does fall through and allow you have to allow you to bring the car back, you are never required to sign a second contract on different terms. So can, you should never let a dealer force you into signing something that you don't want to sign. You, you're only bound by the original contract that you sign. Of course, another option for financing is leasing. So, you know, lo buying the vehicle through a traditional loan versus leasing. And, and people do like to, to know about this option. Um, there are pros and cons of both buying and leasing. You know, with a, when you buy a vehicle, of course, and use a traditional loan, you own the vehicle. You can keep it as long as you want. Leasing, you don't own it. And um, the, you, there are limits to, to any modifications you can do to the vehicle. And... Uh, you, you know, generally are going to be required to return it at the end. The up, upfront costs for buying can be higher than leasing. You may need to put down a larger down payment. Um, but with leasing, you you also will, may have to pay first month's payment of security to deposit, acquisition fee. There may be other fees involved. The monthly payment when you're buying a vehicle is generally going to be higher than that of when you're leasing because you're paying for the entire purchase price of the vehicle. While, whereas when you're leasing, you're only paying for the vehicle's depreciation during the lease term. So you can get a better car for less money. Um, in terms of what happens at the end, obviously with a car, you can sell or trade your vehicle when you buy, you can sell or trade the vehicle at any time. Um, but when you're in a lease, if you try to end the lease early, it can it can be very costly. There can be a, um, very high early termination fees. Um, now, what, when you buy the vehicle, if you decide you want to get a different one, you're going to have to deal with either selling or trading in that vehicle if you want a new one. But with leasing, you always know that at the end of the lease, you can just turn it in and walk away. Uh, with, as far as the future value, of course, when you buy the car, the depreciation is all on you. Um, but in leasing, you have no equity in the vehicle. So um, with when you do buy, you you will accumulate equity as as you as the the time goes along that you could then use towards another vehicle. Mileage uh, limitations can be a problem with leases. Obviously, if you own the car, there's no limit on the number of miles you can drive except for the fact that it may affect the value of the vehicle when you have too many miles on it. But with um, leasing, if you uh, go over the number of miles that uh, the lease permits, you're going to have to pay um, fees and uh, they can be that can be expensive. Same with excess wear and tear. Obviously, um, no cost to you for wear and tear on the vehicle, except in the value of the vehicle. But in a lease, you're going to be responsible for that excess wear and tear and have, may have to pay extra money at the end. Um, with buying, once, once your loan ends, you can continue to use your vehicle without any further payments, which is can be a real benefit having a vehicle that you don't have to make payments on. Uh, but with leasing, you're always going to have a payment. You're going to have to turn that vehicle in, turn around and get another vehicle and still be making payments. But if you want a new car every few years, it can be an easier transition. And of course, um, repairs become an issue when the warranty is over. If you're keeping your car for a long time, obviously it will eventually, the repairs will eventually be on you. With a lease, it's generally for a shorter term. And um, usually your lease is going to end before the warranty, manufacturer's warranty is up. But leasing can be better for some people. I mean, if you want a new car every three or four years, if you're a low mileage driver, uh, if you've got good credit, um, you take good care of your car, or you want a more expensive car than you can afford to buy, leasing may be uh, something to consider. I mean, experts generally say that buying a car is a better financial decision for the long term. Um, but, you know, again, there may be specific in, in instances where leasing may be a benefit. You know, market conditions are making everything more expensive and e even leases, which is part of the reason why you don't 
aren't really seeing as much of that anymore. With inventory shortages, um, there's ma the manufacturer incentives are down, so the um, residual values um, are not as advantageous. Uh, lease mileage limits have dropped, so you can't drive the vehicle as much. And um, the you know rising residual values because of the you know the the rising used car prices, you would think the residual values that they use in the leases would would be reflected in the in the lease terms, but they're not. Um, actually, your best car deal right now might be buying out a lease if you have one when it expires, because a lot of leases now were entered into before the pandemic, and um, when the residual values were still um, being subsidized, and now the the residual value actually may be cheaper than buying a, a used car on the open market. You know, prices are up, but, uh, you know, they may be depreciate. The one thing is that um, depreciation may, may happen more slowly over the next few years because of the short supply. So that is something to, to, um, to think about when you're concerned about how prices are right now. Mm -hmm. Sharon, excuse mm -hmm. me. I have a question about the residual value. Sure. Is that established at the initiation of the lease? Yes. Or when does okay? So yes, it is established at the at the at the um, initiation of the lease because that is the number that's being used to help calculate the payments. Got it. Thank you. So I cannot emphasize enough that you must read every document carefully. You should never sign something that you do not understand. And another thing I can't emphasize enough, there is no three-day right to cancel a car contract. And these things are you know, is becoming even more important as more and more contracts are being provided in electronic formats on tablets or other digital mediums. So, I, understand, I know that that's out there, but they, there is the ability for them to print things out so you can look at it. Even if not, you need to make sure, don't let them rush you through the screens. Read everything. If they're trying to rush you through, that is not, that's not a good business practice for them unless they're trying to hide something. So you want to make sure you understand everything and don't think that you can just sign, take it home and read it and go back the next day if there's something that's not right. That's just not going to happen. Everything has to be as you agreed when you sign it. Otherwise, once your signature is on that paperwork, you are deemed to have understood everything and agreed to all the terms. And of course, going back to what we said before, if you have asked for some for um, for something specific, um, and it's supposed to be part of the deal, you need to make sure that it is in writing. If it's not in writing, it the agreement doesn't exist, and it will be very difficult for you to enforce it. Now we are moving in, on into the maintenance area. Car, the car maintenance part of our presentation, and Bernie is going to take over. Thank you, Sharon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> so, as Sharon said, I'll be doing the uh, maintenance aspect of everything. So, where does that come from? Back in 1966, through a federal act, <clears throat> uh, NHTSA was formed. NHTSA is in charge of recalls, things of this nature, making sure that if they identify a problem with a specific car put up by a manufacturer, they either approach manufacturers directly and they can either do it voluntarily or through the courts force certain recalls. Okay. Uh, what comes to mind is recently, a couple of years ago, there was an airbag situation with Takata. Uh, multiple uh, manufacturers were involved, most of them through NHTSA voluntarily made reached out to the car owners, uh, made arrangements, and repairs were done. Uh, so since 1966, an estimated was it like around 390, 400 million recalls, repairs, things of this nature. Whether it's seat belts, tires, airbags, you name it, they've been involved in it. Uh, so that's who's in charge of uh, being the tip of the spear when it comes to safety recalls. It's NHTSA. And how did they get their authority? 
through a federally mandated act that dates back to 1966. Okay, next slide, please. So where do you find the recalls? Well, you have recalls in safecar.gov, recalls.gov, or nitsa.gov backslash safecar. It's an app. How do you identify it? You put in the year, make, model, uh, 2020 Chevy Suburban, whatever, uh, as well as the VIN. The VIN is more important because it's like your car's social security. It tells you where it was made, how much it weighs, uh, what kind of tires, what kind of engine, has all the pertinence to your vehicle. Uh, so when you're looking up uh, safety recalls, that's what you want to have. Here's a perfect example of our county car's VIN. Where is it located? You can either check in the windshield. It's usually right in the corner on driver's side or right along the, uh, the, the door jam. Okay. And again, it's going to tell you what kind of car. In our situation, it's a passenger car. Where it was made, if you run the VIN, there's certain numerical uh, indicators that tell you its gross weight, where it was made, uh, the motor, all its, specif all its uh, specific information as it pertains to that vehicle. Again, very similar to a person's SSN. Next slide, please. Maintaining your vehicle. Now, if you take anything away from this presentation, here's the one key piece that you want to hold on to above anything else. Please, please, I can't say it enough. Read your owner's manual. Anything and everything you will ever need to know about your particular vehicle will be in your owner's manual. Okay. Uh, it will tell you when to take your car in for service, what services need to be done on regular intervals. Uh, if you take care of your car and read the manual, nine times out of 10, it will take care of you and you will hopefully, hopefully uh, avoid any kind of common problems. Uh, again, Types of vehicles. Any and all vehicles come with owner's manuals. You are talking diesel, gas, hybrid, electric. Uh, electric now is the flavor of the month, so we're going to see a boom in that hopefully rather soon. Uh, oil. Okay, let's start out with gas. Traditional. Uh, again, you have to read your owner's manual. Why? Because it's going to tell you how often you need to change your oil, uh, at what mileage, at what interval, what kind of oil you're going to need to put in there. Is it going to be 10W30, 520? what kind and how often. Uh, also, uh, if you're going to be doing your oil changes, one leak, uh, one weak point in the entire chain would be the filter. If you're going to do your own oil changes, you may want to lean on good name oil filters. You can use uh, manufacturer's equipment or uh, good quality aftermarket pieces, such as from Fram or Purolator, something of the sort. Names that have been out there, names that have earned the trust uh, things that you can depend on. Okay. Uh, we also want to check for leaks. Okay. Depending on, on what you're doing, you may, bear with me one second, please. Thank you. You may have the problem of leaks. With, an, with a traditional gas engine, quickest way to do it is when you pull away from the parking space, if you see leaks on the ground, you have a problem. If you start smelling a burning uh, smell or odor, Probably want to tell your mechanic, I think it's burning oil. Check the oil at least once, twice a week, every so often to make sure it's at the right level it needs to be. Again, if you take care of your equipment, it will take care of you. Read your owner's manual, know where it needs to be on the dipstick. Uh, check it at least every Sunday, every other Sunday, whatever, Monday, whatever floats your boat. Um, because if you're one or two quarts low, eventually that tends to catch up and shorten the life of the motor. Next slide, uh, next slide please. Oh, wiper blades. Wiper blades, now that we're going into the fall and winter, you want to check every six or 12 months. Uh, might cause streaking, might have not that best of a uh, vision when you, when you run it down. So what you do is you get a little alcohol swab, wipe it down nice and clean, give it a whirl. You want to change them out at least once a year, maybe twice a year, six to 12 months, depending on how you need any time in between. Just take a little, little, uh, Alcohol pad, wipe them down one time, make sure they're good to go, check them. You don't want to do it the day of a snowstorm or the day right before you're expecting the ice because, well, everyone's going to be doing it and you might not find your particular size, make and model. Next slide, please. All right, the battery. Nine times out of 10, if you're stranded on the side of the road, it just might be the battery. Why? You have to keep the terminals nice and clean. Okay, if you see any kind of corrosion, any kind of uh, 
stuff just accumulating. You can use Coca-Cola, a nice brush, they have terminal brushes, and you wanna make sure that you have a good connection. If it's just as simple as taking a spray bottle with a little bit of uh, water and just rinsing it down, taking a little a towel and wiping it clean, as long as the connection between the cables and the terminals are good to go, hopefully you have a good connection and you just might avoid getting stuck on the side of the road. Okay, next slide. Brakes. Okay, well, uh, squeaks are normal every so often. Uh, car sits, gets a little bit of stuff on the rotors, not a big deal. Pump it a couple times, stop and go traffic, clears up just fine. What you do need to pay attention to is scraping, grinding, noises that you can almost feel the vibration through the brake pedal because all that really isn't that normal and you need to get some, uh, some attention from a certified technician. So you want to check your owner's manual to see at what point uh, it's recommended to change out the pads, change out the rotors, what's the regular lifespan of the pad rotor combination, have someone take a look at your calipers, make sure it's all good to go, okay? Now, the one thing about brakes, it's, it's a sealed system, but it's not a sealed system, okay? Moisture from the environment has a way of finding its way into the brake system. So if nothing's perfect. You want to get that flushed at least uh, every two-ish years, 30,000 is usually the rule of thumb, but you, again, you want to revert to what your owner's manual says, what the manufacturer of your particular vehicle recommends. Um, again, an ounce of precaution saves you getting stuck on the side of the road at three o'clock in the morning. Belts and hoses, uh, you want to check them frequently. Why? Because like anything that's petroleum-based, they tend to crack, they tend to leak, the, the heat and the cold affects them and their, their lifespan, okay? Uh, again, as I mentioned, leaks, swelling, soft spots, uh, cracks, anything like this, you need to take it to your technician, have them lay hands on it, make sure it's good to go. Uh, again, where do you find this information? Read your owner's manual. Um, that is as important as the day is long. You will learn when to change your hoses, when to change your belts, what to look for, swelling, anything that's abnormal will be specified in this wonderful book. Now, the timing chain. Timing chain, timing belt, depending on what manufacturer you go with. Some have chains, some have belts. That unfortunately isn't as easy to do a visual inspection. You're going to have to take it into the shop. You're going to have to have uh, the manufacturer's recommended preventive maintenance service done to take a look at the lifespan of your particular situation. Are you dealing with the chain? Are you dealing with the belt? If so, does that belt need to get changed after certain intervals of time? Uh, next slide please. Thank you. Tires. Okay, so uh, starting in the mid-late 2000s, around 07, 08-ish, the uh, tire pressure monitoring sensor came out, uh, TPMS, where before you would have to ride, drive your car and notice a thump noise. Well, now your car has a little light that says, hey, give me attention. You need to put some air in me. What affects this? We just recently went from summer to fall, Sometimes the fluctuation in temperature trips these. It just needs a pound or two of pressure and you're good to go. Again, how much do you fill up on your tire? Or how much do you fill your tire to? I should say, I'm sorry. The information is on the actual side of the tire as well as, as we see in 2003, right around the same time on the B pillar. Your tire specifications are clearly seen on the door jam. B pillar. And if you don't have that, it should be inside the cab on passenger side. It will tell you the weight max, the pressure to fill the tire to, uh, the size of the tire, what's recommended, what's not recommended, uh, proper inflation pressure, uh, hot weather, cold weather. And it tell you right across there on this wonderful little tag that is clearly visible. Again, B pillar or inside passenger. Uh, Driver. Next slide, please. Driver's side. Oh, pardon. Okay, so hybrid vehicles. Uh, again, advancing technology, it's not going to cost much more than regular cars. Uh, you're going to get far better gas mileage, less wear and tear on moving parts, brakes, things of that nature, um, less out of pocket expense. Now, the good thing about the, the direction we're starting to go to is before you used to have to take them to the dealerships, now because of advancing technology and the fact that it's been out there for a while at this point, now, most independent shops can work on these vehicles, so you don't have to be chained to your model or your, your car's manufacturer, your car's dealer, 
uh, regardless of flavor of vehicle that you're driving. Most independents can work at them, so that should help the price point if that's something you're considering. Uh, you just need to make sure that the person turning the wrench on your vehicle is well-versed on your particular hybrid, uh, on the make, model, year, what have you. Make sure that they're competent and know what they're doing. Next slide, please. Uh, maintenance. So there's no, no real special maintenance needed. However, uh, much like with any new technology, there's always an Achilles heel, a weak point. And some hybrids, not all of them. Uh, we see this as the battery packs, okay? So most manufacturers, the way they remedied it was by giving a longer period or a longer mileage to go ahead and address this issue. So if it becomes an issue and uh, the, the battery pack becomes compromised in any way, shape, or form, you rather have eight, eight years, 100,000 miles, or 10 years, 150, 150,000 miles to get it addressed. So hopefully you're going to be covered. Uh, again, with hybrid, um, because it's using uh, the new technology of electric gas, not solely on gas, what happens? Your petroleum-based products tend to last longer, i.e. oil changes. Oil changes instead of every 2,500 to 3,000 miles now with good oils and this technology of hybrid, you can stretch it out to about 5,000 miles, okay? Again, that's just rule of thumb. You want to always check your owner's manual, okay? Uh, again, uh, based on the union technology and the braking system that hybrids employ, the regenerative braking system, not the traditional, ju let's just uh, heat everything up and grab onto them and hope it works uh, in the layman's terms. Uh, you now have braking systems that last far longer as well as their pads because of the regenerative braking system. Uh, next slide, please. I apologize. Am I going too fast? Do I have any questions? No? Okay. So the one thing you need to keep an eye out for hybrids is when jumping the vehicle, if your car dies and you decide to jump start it, you may want to read the owner's manual ahead of time. It's a really good idea. Why? Because within this platform of vehicle, you have AC and DC systems that if you do it incorrectly or someone who's working on the vehicle does something incorrectly, it can cause catastrophic bodily injury. It's highly recommended. Please, please read your owner's manual before trying to jumpstart this particular kind of vehicle. Okay. Uh, again, it will have any and every situation you would want to deal with in your owner's manual. It'll tell you the proper procedures, how to do it, where to do it. It's not as straightforward as a classic gasoline engine. Next slide, please. So, electric vehicles. Uh, well, there's very, very little maintenance as compared to diesel or gas engines. Why? Because there's no combustion system. Fewer moving parts, less fluids to change. So you're pretty much looking at braking, a brake fluid, and washer fluid. Okay. Um, again, you probably want to revert back to your owner's manual. Okay. Uh, to see what the maintenance would be on these two fluids, what's the recommended interval for flushing, uh, what kind of fluid, things of this nature. Next slide, please. So the cooling system, okay? Uh, these are the two that I've mentioned already. Uh, you still have certain heat management systems on electrical vehicle. So you always wanna stay on top of the level. Uh, you want to check it from time to time. Same thing with your uh, washer fluid, brake fluid, things of this nature. Um, the braking system, even though it's similar to the hybrid, it does use the uh, regenerative um, system in which it converts the kinetic energy and helps uh, stop your, your car instead of just clamp down on it with a set of pads and it grind itself away. No, uh, again, so you have your brake fluids, your cooling, and your windshield washers. Those are your three fluids mostly that you need to stay on top of in your electric vehicles. Uh, you would want to check for pre preventive maintenance service out of your owner's manual and see what your particular manufacturer recommends, as well as what interval. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, your battery systems. Again, uh, much like your, your hybrids, in some instances, not all, uh, it's your Achilles heel. Uh, as such, manufacturers went ahead and extended either based on years or mileage so that if you have any issues with your, your battery pack 
in, in electric and hybrid, they can be and normally are covered as this technology becomes more rampant, as we see now almost every manufacturer is putting out some models in electric. It seems that that might just be the way of the future. It's becoming more common. They're addressing any and all issues. It's becoming far more dependable. So things that we will see with electric vehicles that you do not see in diesel or gas, uh, anything to do with the combustion system. Okay, so we're not saying you won't need oil changes, you won't need spark plugs, you won't need uh, any kind of wiring, air fuel, uh, air filters, exhaust system, mufflers, catalytic converters, anything that had to do with uh, a combustible, traditional uh, combustible mo combustion motor has gone the way of the dodo bird, at least with electric vehicles. Okay, so that's one thing that saves you money in the long run. Again, what do you want to take away from this? Above all, you always want to check your owner's manual. You want to check your engine oil at least once or twice a month. Check it as needed based on your owner's manual. You're going to want to check your, your washer fluid to make sure it's there when you need it, not the day of a snowstorm. Once a month, you want to check your, your, your coolant. You want to check your, uh, your tire pressure. Your battery, especially going into the winter months, you want to make sure that the cold weather does not affect your battery and there's no corrosion in the sort. You want to do that at least once a month. Make sure your, your, your lights are all squared away, wiper blades are squared away with your windshield. Okay. Simple cleaning makes the world a difference when a downpour comes in. So, again, a little pervading service goes a long way. Now that the winter months are coming and the sub zero temperatures are coming in the winter, you always want to keep your locks and hinges lubricated. No one loves being frozen out of their car in the middle of February or locked out of their car because of a frozen lock in February, I should say. I apologize. Next, next slide. Okay, so some helpful hints. Uh, National Automobile Dealers Association. Okay, you have Kelly Blue Book, Edmonds, Consumer Reports, Washington Consumers, uh, Checkbook, Yelp, National Insurance Crime Bureau. Uh, consumer world and the office of the attorney general why these will give you tips these will tell you what to be on the lookout they'll give you a price point they will help you understand what usually fails on your particular make model year as well as how to prevent it next slide please do we have any questions no huh? thank you Right, no questions. You can post them in the chat or raise your hand. This is our contact information if anybody has questions that they think about later. All right, sounds good. Wow, you two are impressive, Sharon and Bernie. You always you. manage to share just an, a huge amount of information in a short time period. So thank you so much for like helping us approach car buying and car care with a little more knowledge. And you know, I always learn something every time I meet with you guys. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. And thank you to the folks who um, joined us for the workshop. Um, I want you all to remember to do the post-workshop survey, and I want you to promise to read your owner's manual. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we are going to continue our conversation about owning a car. Um, next week's workshop is how do I select auto insurance? And they will also talk a little bit about renter's insurance, but there is much to learn. So if you want a reminder about our upcoming workshops, we suggest that you sign up for our newsletter and we will be in touch shortly with all the resources from this workshop. So everyone have a great week. And um, as always, let us know how legal aid can help you. Thank you.